name's Steve Cox. I'm a project officer at Headland Archaeology. And earlier this year, I led a team excavating a site at 100 North Street, St. Andrews. And today I'm going to present the results of the excavation. The presentation here is based on the results of the initial assessment. Further analysis, such as radiocarbon dating and specialist reports, are yet to take place. Uh, most of you will be familiar with the history of St. Andrews, but for those who aren't, here's uh, an extremely brief outline. The settlement of St. Andrews dates back to at least the 8th century AD. There was a monastery by the early 10th century, and St. Andrews Cathedral was founded about 1160, and the secular settlement developed around the ecclesi ecclesiastical center uh, to the west. In the 12th century, there was a planned expansion of the town, and North Street is one of the three streets that were laid out extending westwards from the secular settlement. The excavation area, outlined in red on the slide on the right, extended south from North Street and covered an area the size of two medieval burgage plots. The excavation was required as part of a planning condition prior to the redevelopment of the site, and it was funded by the developer. So the first phase of works was a trial trench evaluation, which established the presence of significant archeological remains in the southern half of the site. No archaeological remains survived in the northern part of the site where it fronts onto North Street. The construction of a police station on the site in the 1930s had removed any trace of earlier buildings. An area was opened up for excavation almost immediately following the trial trenching. And this was apparently the largest open area excavation in St. Andrews since the Bayer Theatre excavation in the 1990s. The excavation at North Street revealed linear ditches, rubbish pits, quarry pits, a kiln, and a stone structure ranging in date from the 12th to the 17th centuries. The archaeological features represent the continuous and fairly intense occupation of the backlands of the Burgage plots. We've assigned the features to five phases. The phasing is based on the stratigraphic relationships and the dating of finds recovered from the fills. You'll notice there's a bit of an overlap between phases two and three, and we hope that a radiocarbon dating program will improve some of the chronology. So phase one. Three ditches and one pit were assigned to the first phase. The ditches were relatively shallow at less than 0.4 meters deep. No finds and no environmental evidence were recovered from the features. Similar undated features truncated by Burgage plot divisions have been identified in other excavations in St. Andrews. This shows that sporadic settlement did occur prior to the expansion of the town. It's phase two. Nearly half the features we uncovered on the site belong to phase two, and they all appear to belong to the eastern plot of the two Burgage plots. The features include ditches that probably relate to the division of space within the Burgage plots, and the number of pits that varied in size and shape and depth of fills. All the pits contained domestic waste, such as food remains and pottery sherds. This photo shows the deepest pit on the site. It was nearly two meters deep. It was probably dug to extract sand or clay. The light yellow fill at the edges represents slumping of the sides. It was backfilled with waste material. It was then truncated by a large pit, which was entirely contained within it. And you should be able to see the 
uh, cut of that pit in this section. It's likely that the pits were dug and backfilled within a short space of time. The most interesting feature on the site was recorded to the south of these pits. It's interpreted as the terminal end of a large linear ditch. There's a pit at the northern end of the ditch, which is likely to be part of the same construction. The pit was surrounded by five post holes two of which have packing stones in them, and they may have supported a roof over the pit. At the southern end of the feature, which in the photo on the right is uh, at the bottom of the picture, there was some edge set stone slabs which had been positioned along the eastern and western sides, which may have supported a cover of stone slabs or wooden planks. Between these stones and the pit, there were flat stones which capped a V-shaped channel. So the contents of the southern section, which is on the right, in the photo on the right, would have flowed via the channel into the pit. The fills of the pit resulted from washing in of the material from the channel. Later fills probably relate to the abandonment of the feature by the deposition of waste material. We know this feature wasn't a latrine, as there was no cess material recovered from the fills. And at the moment, we don't know what its function was. Two similar pits were recorded close to the linear feature. They were unlike the other features on site. Both contained thin fills that alternated between charcoal-rich layers and the erosion of surrounding soil. The charcoal-rich layers looked like hearth material, but no hearths were observed nearby. We recovered fragments of pottery from the pit in the left photo that comprised 25% of a complete jar of Scottish white gritty ware. In fact, the vast majority of pottery fragments we found on site are Scottish white gritty ware. On to phase three. Four rubbish pits and one kiln were assigned to phase three. They were all located in the northern part of the excavation area, which suggests that the southern part of the site was given over to activities that left no archeological trace. The smallest pit of the four contained the most interesting find on site which was an upright, intact, medieval jug. <laughs> so the jug is Scottish white gritty ware. It's been dated to the 13th to 14th centuries. It's got glazed shoulders, although the glazing has faded a bit, and a strap handle. You can actually see the thumbprints of the potter who attached that strap handle to the jug. It's a normal domestic jug and was used for short-term liquid storage. It was probably produced locally. It's likely it was empty when it was placed in the pit as it contained the same fill as the primary fill that surrounded it. The survival of an intact jug is unusual and at the moment, we don't know why it was placed in the pit like this. The three other pits in phase three were all similar in size. All three have been used for rubbish deposition. They had steeply sloping sides and were over a meter deep. One pit contained an almost complete dog skeleton and a separate canine skull right at the base. These, we think, represent the disposal of individual domestic animals, as opposed to the disposal of animals relating to tanning activities. The heavily truncated base of a kiln was also recorded. It comprised a flat stone surface with a flue to the south, which is on the right in the photo, which was lined with edge-set stones on each side. 
no evidence of a superstructure to the kiln survived. Very small amounts of slag were recovered from the fill immediately above the stone surface. And it's possible that the kiln was used for small scale metalworking activities. On to phase four. There's a change in the nature of the activity in phase four. So gone are the rubbish pits. Instead, there's a stone filled ditch and some pits of unknown function in the southwest corner of the site. But the most interesting feature is a stone structure to the north. The stone structure comprised a stone wall formed of roughly shaped stones bonded by clay. There's a single flat stone at the base of the feature, uh, just uh, next to the meter scale in the photo which may be the remains of a stone floor surface subsequently removed. In the northwest corner of the structure, which is the uh, uh, bottom right in the photo, a stone block had been placed at a steep angle to form a chute. Within the fill of this chute, a stone roof tile was recovered. And we noted that this tile fitted neatly across the gap, as you can see in the photo. That's not how we found it. It may have been used to control the flow of liquid into the pit, although this probably wasn't very effective given that there's the presence of a hole in the tile. In the southern wall, there's a culvert at the level of the base. The chute would have uh, been the inflow into the pit and the culvert was the outflow. The fill of the culvert contained four slow stones two grape seeds, as well as cess material. The fill just above the stone floor of the structure itself contained, amongst other things, a lot of fish bones concentrated in the area just below the chute. So the primary function of the structure was a latrine, and it was used later as a rubbish pit. The dating evidence comes from a clay pipe stem and a shirt of pottery which were both recovered from the fill of the structure, not the culvert. A similar structure was found in the Bayer Theatre excavations. It also contained slow stones, grape seeds and fish bones, but it was assigned to a phase that dated to the 13th to 14th centuries. So it's going to be interesting to get a radiocarbon date, hopefully from the culvert. So the backlands of St Andrews and, and other medieval Scottish towns are renowned for their deep garden soil deposits. This is the black deposit in the photo. This was between 0.5 and 0.9 metres thick across the excavation area. The medium brown deposit in the photo is interpreted as a medieval topsoil layer and the interface between that and the deposit above is the original medieval ground surface. Features belonging to phases two and three were observed cutting this layer in the balks. But during machine excavation of the site, the edges of these features were very poorly defined in plan. And we suggest that that's the result of sustained biological mixing of the soil after the features have gone out of use which caused the edges of them to lose definition. The actions that created the dark brown layer, the garden soil, belong to a period between phases three and four. And there are two interpretations for this layer. One is that the soil is the result of material being brought onto site in order to improve the cultivation potential for the soil. And the other, is that the soil is the result of the accumulation of turf and soil introduced to the site as building materials for walls, roofs and floors, which decayed and were replaced repeatedly. It was not possible to determine which model fits the sediments uncovered at North Street. So there have been quite a few developer-funded excavations in St Andrews over the past decades. 
and there is an established narrative for the development of the town. This involves fairly intensive use of the backlands during the few hundred years when St Andrews was developing as an important Scottish town. This is followed by a decline in the post-medieval period. Each excavation adds more weight to the story of St Andrews. So the findings of this excavation flesh out the story of the town rather than challenging the narrative. The next step is to commission specialist reports and to get some radiocarbon dates before producing a report for publication in a journal. If you want more inf information about the jug, we've made a short film which shows it being excavated on site and cleaned back in the lab and it's on Headland Archaeology's YouTube channel. And finally, there's some acknowledgements. And thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you.